час с новостями. Подведем итоги сегодняшнего дня. Тиви Рей, дождь. The only Russia's independent country. We are not allowed to work in our country anymore. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. It's a real war. Maybe there are some negotiations about that. There will be very serious consequences. TV Rain Newsroom presents Russia Tomorrow. After a week of spectacular violence, everything in Putin's war has changed. Bridges fall apart, ground combat shifts to airstrikes, propaganda reaches new lows, and the bloody tide drones more innocent life. This is Russia Tomorrow. Daily efforts to broadcast to our Russian audience continue from our busy studio in Europe. But once a week, we put our focus on top stories for viewers outside Russia. Nothing else about our mission at TV Rain has changed. I am Valeria Ratnikova, and we have much to discuss. Rockets, explosions, screams. Russian strategic air forces launch cruise missiles across Ukraine and kill civilians just waking up to another day in Putin's terrible war. A new general takes over and a new bloodthirsty phase of terror begins. Sergei Surovakin is brought in to optimize violence, destruction and death. The bridge from Russia to Ukraine is shattered and laying in pieces. Another symbolic side of Putin's war for no reason is targeted by a hidden truck bomb. State TV and media propagandists all start singing a new tune one after another, each echoing a bloody desire for a deep feeling of revenge. 23 dead and nearly 100 injured. Those are the results of massive airstrikes launched Monday morning by the Russian armed forces on cities across Ukraine. Alongside civilian deaths caused by the rockets, more than 70 different sites around the country were hit in a furious and intense barrage of destruction. Air raid sirens across the country sounded warnings to seek cover and send millions of frightened residents into shelters. Simultaneous launches from Russia's air, sea and land-based military assets sent dozens of cruise missiles at the same time into the airspace of different Ukrainian regions and cities, including Kiev, Lviv, Odessa and Kharkiv. Images of the damage soon showed the randomness of civilian targets seemingly chosen with no clear military value. A children's playground, a bus in morning commuter traffic, the Taras Shevchenko University, a bike path over a glass bridge. Later, Ukrainian officials said the missiles damaged part of Kyiv water supply network, office buildings, the German consulate's visa department, numerous power plants across the country, and an energy substation near Kremenchuk. In the largest day of airstrike activity since Russia invaded Ukraine in February, President Zelensky said 84 missiles were fired and 43 were shut down by air defense. The Ukrainian leader also said 13 of 24 combat drones, including pilotless Iranian kamikaze aircraft, were shut down as well. Putin's idea of a Russian world seemingly falls apart when Russian rockets blow out office windows in the Department of Russian Language and Literature at Kyiv's National University. A strike on civilians that deliberately inspires fear is terrorism. These airstrikes fit the definition precisely. All because the previous several weeks have shown that Putin is incapable of anything else, not at organizing parades to celebrate the storming of Kiev three days after invasion in February, not at hanging Russian flags over the administrative buildings in Nikolaev and Kharkiv, no occupier control over any population center other than her which slips further towards the leading edge of battle with every new day. So instead, Putin shoots up city centers because it is all he is capable of. Russia tomorrow. 
Monday's airstrikes came just two days after Putin named a new general to fight his war, replacing field commanders once again after repeated failures on the ground. And in contrast to the army officers who have led since February, now it is Air Force General Sergei Surovikin who will be in charge of more civilian destruction against Ukraine in this war. The 56-year-old Surovikin was previously head of Russia's space forces fighting in Ukraine, and he replaces Army General Alexander Dvorkin, who led combat operations since April. Both of these generals and many more field and staff officers in Russian's command structure all spent much of the previous decade fighting in Syria, where their logistical skills and violent brutality were tested and perfected in places like Aleppo and Deir Izor, where they flattened cities and killed civilians for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. After recent public criticisms of infantry generals by Ramzan Kadyrov and Yevgeny Prigozhin, Surovikin's promotion is raw meat for the bloodthirsty. Because more than anything, Surovikin is a symbolic designation by Putin and the Ministry of Defense that from now forward the war will be fought vengefully. Surovikin does what he is told and gets promoted into new duties, not because he is a brilliant officer, they say, but because other officers before him simply failed at their jobs. Russia tomorrow. The 19-kilometer bridge across the Straits of the Azov Sea from Russia to Crimea was Vladimir Putin's great construction project aimed at reunifying old Soviet borders on the Black Sea and forging his legacy as a great leader. To build the longest bridge in Europe, hundreds of billions of rubles were spent on concrete and steel piles and pillars in the seabed, shipping sh channel arch over four lanes of vehicle traffic and elevated rail line for passengers and freight. Putin himself sat in the red cabin of Russian-made Kamas dump truck and drove the 19 kilometers linking Krasnodar region in Russia with occupied Ukraine to inaugurate the bridge on opening day. These symbolic video images show a proud man shifting into gear in chatting happily with a veteran bridge worker who tells fables from the construction. But on the 8th of October, in the early morning hours of Saturday in fall, an explosive device likely placed by Ukrainian special services inside a truck similar to the one Putin drove across in May of 2018 ignited just at the lip of a small hill on the westbound lane sending a giant fireball into the sky. Putin, who just one day before had marked his 70th birthday in a manner subdued when, compared to previous jubilees, called the bridge bombing terrorism and blamed the regime in Kyiv. He vowed revenge above all and later used his designation to launch Monday's airstrikes across Ukraine. With more on recent events, we now turn to my TV Rain colleague Ekaterina Katrikadze. We can't speak with much certainty about who exactly struck the Kerchinsky Bridge. The Ukrainian reaction looks confused and ambiguous. On the one hand, we see Victoria's social media posts from government officials, but on the other hand, after a few hours later, deny any involvement in the explosion. Crimea and the bridge is just the beginning. Everything illegal must be taken down. The Crimean bridge formed the most intense part of the conflict that has taken place in the Russian Federation. It's just difficult to say exactly who in the special services decided to play this card. But neither can we throw out any of the other versions that have come our way so far as the facts remain insufficient. The explosion on the Kerchinsky bridge was a strike on something sacred and important, not just for Putin, but for millions of other Russians as well. Theoretically, at least, it could be the work of the president of Russia himself, with the objective of motivating Russian society as a whole, of unifying people around their national leader. Could he do that? Overnight on the 8th of September in 1999, an apartment complex was blown up in Moscow. This was on Guryanova Street. It was followed by explosions at another Moscow address on the Kashirsky Highway and later again in the city of Volgodonsk. Vladimir Putin was prime minister when the explosions occurred. 
Within hours, authorities laid the blame for these monstrous crimes at the feet of Chechens. And by September 30th, federal troops began pouring into Chechnya for the Second Chechen War. It was the image of an iron-willed Czechist able to defend Russia from terrorists with a strong hand that was prepared to grip the nation after the weak and sickly Yeltsin that brought Putin to power. Discussions around the Crimean bridge today bring up memories of those terrorist acts in Russia at the end of the 1990s. Those who are convinced of participation of the secret services say if he could do it back then, he can do it now. I don't know whether Vladimir Putin had any direct relationship to the deaths of hundreds of people in those buildings. I just know that I lived at 19 Guryanova Street and at the time of the explosion my mother was at home. Her remains were never found. In all the years since, the president never came to a memorial service, never spoke in memory of the deceased, never even pronounced the names of those who were killed in the most pathetic way possible while sleeping in their beds. For Putin and his underlings, such problems simply don't exist. In the place where our home once stood, four new apartment block towers were erected. This is not an attempt to draw any kind of conclusions, rather what I see here is a total lack of empathy. I would not be surprised if the first version of events around Kerchinsky Bridge appear to be true. But there is a second version that somebody inside, somebody from the block of Siloviki, maybe Defense Ministry of Intelligence, decided to humiliate the colleagues from Federal Security Service. This version is the one put forward by Mikhail Podolyak, official advisor to the Zelensky administration in Kyiv. And now the FSB is trying to eliminate the leadership of the Defense Ministry and the military. Before the change in personnel, the FSB was down for the count. They'd missed the bridge bombing. The Department of Defense can now blame the FSB for the future loss of the South. Isn't it obvious who was behind the explosion? The truck was coming from the Russian Federation. But for now, the most plausible version of the events is the following. Vladimir Putin's holy construction project, his super expensive baby, was heavily crippled and nearly destroyed by Ukrainian special forces. My best guess is that Western powers are against this type of actions by Kiev, which in turn requires Zelensky and his office to refrain from public commentary about the bridge. However, there was no holding back when it came to the endless stream of social media memes and short videos about the bridge, the explosion and the Russian president's big 70th birthday the day before. Now, for how the West is reacting, in the US, in Germany, in France, and in countless other governments of the progressive world, there is once again fear of antagonizing Putin, a fear that seems to be justified because now they are obliged to seek off ramps and call for abundant caution. But, of course, this raises the simple question, isn't it a bit too late for that already? Ответы со стороны России будут жесткими и по своим масштабам будут соответствовать уровню угроз, создаваемых Российской Федерацией. What is crucial in understanding Putin is that he is obsessed. He firmly decided to occupy Ukraine, to take Kiev. This is his white whale and he will continue to act on the basis of this decision, whether the Crimean bridge burns or not. It is also crucial to remember that there can be absolutely no justification for killing civilians, but for those who died that morning on the Kerchinsky bridge, just like the rest of those who have perished in this war in Kiev and Lviv, in Donetsk and Luhansk, in Izium and in Bucha, literally everywhere, those deaths are all on the conscience of the leadership of the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation, in violation of international law, annexed a chunk of foreign territory and after eight years attacked its neighbor with treachery. Vladimir Putin bears responsibility for the deaths of 350 children and tens of thousands of adults. Without even using the Crimean bridge, he bombed Kiev in February and March, forcing millions of people to flee their own homes, destroying an untold number of lives. If, in response, Ukraine blows up a tractor trailer, then 
Who are we to judge? Who are we to say, this is short-sighted, don't poke the Russian bear? Listen, if Kiev had paid service to all of the advice it was given, then it would have been under the heel of a Moscow-installed puppet a long time ago. And Russian forces would have moved right up to the Moldova border in a direct threat to the European Union. I understand if a great segment of viewers here watching are deeply troubled by images of a burning bridge. But I call on you to remember under which circumstances exactly this bridge was built. And if there hadn't been a wide-scale war in Ukraine in the first place, the bridge would have gone untouched. Just imagine, right up until Ukraine was invaded, the West was ready to launch Nord Stream 2. And now, not only is there no more Nord Stream 2, there is no more Nord Stream 1. The Russian president severed all ties and ruined international projects that Russia had invested billions of dollars in. He cut off any possibility of a retreat and, by his own doing, trapped himself in a corner. Ukraine has every right to fight to the end. Ukraine will never forgive Russia for this exploded apartment blocks, nor for the screams of children and their fearful parents, nor dead bodies in the streets. The strikes of the Russian armed forces destroyed children's playgrounds and the nightmare won't end until Putin is stopped by force. Russia tomorrow. Faces said that the Crimea bridge fell into the sea turned upside down on state TV this week soon after the smoke from Russian airstrikes on Ukraine cleared away. Once Putin's durable enough explanation for these airstrikes on vulnerable civilian infrastructure filtered back from the day's Security Council briefing broadcast in the morning, the talking heads around the rhetorical fire pit spent the rest of the day rolling out new lines of communication to explain whatever it is they thought they had just been told to do. Что они уязвимы, что им нечего противопоставить нашим крылатым ракетам, тем же дронам. Но не могли они этого не знать. Тем не менее, мост. Тем не менее, глумятся. Some sort to praise. День настал. Наконец-то Россия начала бить киевский режим. Бейте по центрам принятия решений. Вы обещали, вы дали нам слово. Чем бандеровские упыри поплатятся за Крымский мост? И как победить обыкновенный украинский фашизм? Об этом сегодня в нашей программе. Why the long face? Morning, everyone. The more violently that Russia attacks the cities of Ukraine, the more those people will love Russia later, after they've been liberated from American dictatorship. The weaker Russia acts, the more it will be despised and hated. But the harder the brutality, the deeper the future love. What if this morning is just Nazis practicing shooting at our conscripts? Some came to bury. We warned you, Zelensky, that Russia hasn't really gotten going yet. So stop complaining like a cheapskate and run away while you still can. Run, Zelensky, run. Don't look back, run towards the West. And here comes the answer. From the very beginning, the Crimean Bridge was an uncrossable line. It was obvious. They say that you should measure seven times and then make one cut. That slow and steady wins the race. There's plenty of proverbs to draw from this morning, but the message is one. Russia prepares carefully, but moves quickly. And some just came to shake it like a Polaroid picture. To say that I'm happy is an understatement. I'm dancing on the balcony in my Russian army pajamas. Dance moves indeed are perhaps the best way to explain this abrupt propaganda period. Where just days earlier on state TV, the talking heads moaned about the chaotic mobilization and begged everyone to stop lying. Now they were positively gloating, handing out digital high fives in sync, one after the other, lockstep to the beat of the drum in the best imitation of themselves. The purpose of Russia's massive state propaganda machine is too much to relate here in full, dear viewer. But if it ever confuses you with its obvious contradictions or ignored truths, then it's not a mistake to conclude that being in an obvious state of confusion might be the propaganda's ultimate goal. That way you just give up. 
We now turn to Julia Davis and welcome her to our program here at Russia Tomorrow. Julia is a leading expert on Russian propaganda and misinformation, specializing in Kremlin tactics in psychological warfare pushed through state media outlets and social media. Like no other Western observer, Julia regularly exposes and publishes the seemingly endless lies and manipulations that come from the mouth of propagandists. Julia, welcome to Russia Tomorrow. I'm really glad to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Yes, the first question I want to ask you, because you watch propaganda much. So what do you see last few days? How, was it, how has it changed? Uh, what happened with propagandists? Are they now, um, as we can say, freed from their limits that were before? You know, it was very interesting to observe. First, there was this wave of uh, depression and uh, borderline panic when they realized that the Russian troops were losing on the battlefield. And you could see that, that this wave was leading up to urge more people to um, not resist uh, mobilization, to go in and volunteer. And then uh, there were these constant calls that there is no way around it. Ukraine's infrastructure has to be destroyed, and any target is a legitimate target. And then it uh, culminated with these recent uh, strikes that uh, suddenly totally changed the mood there. It was more of a celebration, a jubilation, and they were not ashamed to show the strikes that were obviously not targeting any kind of military targets, but just the city, the the uh, play uh, places where children would play they had even i understand that they have artificially added some screams to that footage some music to oh, that really? footage yes and it was really horrifying i had actually tweeted out one of those videos because they uh, had themselves singing, finally, this is happening, this is the day we were promised the strikes against decision-making centers. And uh, one of the guests on the program actually complained that everyone was being too negative when they said it wasn't enough, it wasn't good enough, and all of Ukraine's infrastructure has to be destroyed. Um, and uh, he complained that the mood of tens of uh, millions of Russians has been ruined because they're being so negative about such a great and wonderful event that uh, there were strikes on Kiev and multiple other cities in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Julia, yes, um, as you said, the mood really changed. Firstly, as we can see last week and weeks before, it was more like gloomy. Now in, it's joyful. They're really celebrating something. Can you say, is this the real face of this, as we can say, I suppose, bloodthirsty supporters? It seems to be uh, that way because, you know, it's been building up to this for, for eight years. These same propagandists have been advocating that Ukraine needed to be invaded, that it needed to be taken. A lot of people in the West would uh, tell me, no, that's just for domestic propaganda. They would never do it. It wouldn't happen. But they're obviously very active participants in this, and they seem to really be taking joy in this because... Uh, uh, if Ukraine does not submit militarily, then they are more than willing to see it destroyed in some other way. And uh, they don't seem to have the, the slightest feeling towards um, any of the civilians that are being massacred or even the Ukrainian soldiers that are dying just defending their land from this absolutely mindless, pointless war. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we can say that this month's uh, propaganda really changed with some new developments depending on the situation on the ground. But actually, can we categorize these propagandists if, um, if there are groups like that? Maybe uh, some of them are true believers, some of them are doing that for money. Is, there, um, is it possible uh, to see these groups? I think 
it's uh, it's kind of um, self-evident. There are some that are extremely proactive. You can see they really believe it, and then others seem to hesitate a little, but they're still doing it. So, um, but I believe at the core of it, they all know what's going on, and they all know how wrong it is, and uh, there are just different degrees of it. And some are are completely gung ho, and also they're obviously receiving directives on uh, how to act when all of a sudden the same propagandists that previously would not dare to criticize uh, any part of the Russian government or uh, much less the defense ministry all of a sudden are feeling brave enough quote unquote but really they've been told to do this because the blame has to be pinned on someone other than Putin so all of a sudden they're criticizing certain parts of the government or certain officials but but it's uh, definitely not journalism. It's more of uh, they're being part of this war machine, and uh, they are war criminals along with those that are being sent by Putin to massacre people in a neighboring country. Mm -hmm. And I also want to ask you, what's the common knowledge in the West? Uh, what's the real effect of propaganda on Russian people is? How is estima estimated? Well, there wasn't that much understanding. It started to change after the annexation of Crimea, but even then, um, that was the reason that I started the Russian Media Monitor, because I would see how many lies uh, companies like RT, well, mainly it was RT, the English-speaking branch in the West, they were the most proactive. They spread mm -hmm. a lot of lies, a lot of propaganda, and the Western media, for the most part, didn't do a whole lot to debunk what they were saying. So a lot of the audience, if they saw that, they believed it. There wasn't much to contradict it. Now things are, are very different. Um, after this uh, intensified uh, full-fledged invasion, the, the media here started to cover more about uh, the way Putin's propaganda is so oppressive, how uh, real journalism has been pushed out and forced to leave uh, Russia or is facing prison time, is, is uh, facing horrific oppression. So a lot of people are definitely more educated on that topic right now. And uh, the videos that I am putting out showing from the propagandist mouse themselves, what they're doing, what they're saying and what that means, it has awakened a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, do the people in the West understand, if it's like that, that propaganda, uh, as I think, does not represent uh, the majority, the real majority of people in Russia? How, what do they think about that? That is a question that I get asked almost every day. Uh, they ask me, but how many Russians actually believe that? And that is so difficult to, to estimate because in uh, that kind of an authoritarian regime, a lot of people would be afraid to, to say what they actually mean for fear of getting prosecuted or persecuted. And uh, But I think what is more, more telling than that is how many Russians have left the country once this invasion started? How many more have left once the mobilization started? I think that is more telling than any poll that even while all of this was happening and it seemed like there was so much public support for Putin's war, um, many people did realize that it wasn't real, that it was just uh, forced upon them. And when it was time to, to make that choice, whether they wanted to support this invasion or even die for it, they obviously aren't willing to do that, and they obviously know what's going on. So that I find very encouraging as to mm -hmm. uh, how many Russians actually know the truth. And I believe it, it is... Uh, a large portion of the society that that knows the truth or is on the brink of realizing what is really happening. Mm -hmm. Julie, I would like to go to a more personal question. I can, I can say you watch hours and hours of uh, these propaganda shows. You translate them for English-speaking audience. Uh, do you see the effect that this propaganda uh, makes on your psyche? Um, do you do you see that some new emotions are um, evoked by that propaganda? 
It's mainly rage, especially when I see them realize that things that they're saying have been debunked multiple times, and yet they're saying them with a straight face, or when they are talking about the pain and suffering that they're causing and they're actually enjoying it. But I try to approach it very clinically as though I'm collecting the evidence for their future war trials. And also I'm trying to um, show to people in the West what is going on in Russia and use the words of those very propagandists to expose what they're doing. So in that sense, I'm able to uh, distance myself in the emotional sense and not absorb the the emotions that just a, a person watching them that maybe doesn't have another source of information might feel. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've already asked you about the effect uh, on Russian people, especially of the of the propaganda. But what uh, what can you say? What's the ultimate goal of the propaganda now? Right now, the ultimate goal is to justify. Uh, the new waves of mobilization that will continue to happen. They're also being prepared that things are going to get worse in terms of the economy. The sanctions will start having more and more effect. There will be more sanctions. They're being prepared for terrible times to come. They're being told that somebody else is at fault and now they have no other choice but to unite around Putin. And uh, these uh, propagandists like Margarita Simonian of uh, RT who goes out there and claims that if Russia doesn't win this war, Russians will end up in concentration camps, won't be allowed to speak their language. Just ridiculous tales like that uh, shows me that they're panicking, but that people might want a peaceful solution. They might want Russia to mm -hmm. withdraw and go back home. And that's what they're trying to prevent, because the end of this regime will be the end of those propagandist lives as they know it. And uh, they're definitely going to, to try very hard to convince people or scare people into uh, following down that path. Uh, thank you very much for being with us and for the job that you are doing. It's really, really important. Thank you so much and thank you guys for everything that you do in spite of all the odds. Russia tomorrow. And now we are joined by Dr. Anna Neistat, legal director of the docket at the Clooney Foundation for Justice. Dr. Neistat has worked in international human rights for over two decades and investigated more than 60 conflict areas around the world and has held executive research positions at Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. We are delighted to have her here with us now. Uh, Dr. Neistat, thank you very much for coming to Rush tomorrow. I'm really glad to see you here. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my first question uh, is about Russian propagandists. Do you think they really can be tried for their propaganda in the tribunal? The short answer is yes, and there are historical precedents for that, and that's definitely one of the cases that uh, we are also working on. It's not uh, very straightforward, legally speaking. There are several options. Uh, the most well-known one is probably the crime of incitement to genocide. Uh, this is what came out, for example, in the Rwanda tribunal mm -hmm. uh, some years ago. And in fact, one of the people accused of that crime is just now facing justice, you know, a few uh, decades after the crimes were committed. But uh, it is a crime under international law. It is a crime under Rome statute, uh, the statute that the International Criminal Court is operating on. Uh, but the facts of this, the elements of this crime, are not very easy to establish. I want to talk to you maybe more specifically. You've already uh, mentioned uh, the case of uh, Felicia Kabugov of uh, Rwanda, who is um, now judged in, in The Hague uh, after decades, um, as you said. My first question, if we can really compare the methods of propaganda which, uh, which was done in Rwanda and of um, uh, modern propaganda in Russia, and, and if, we, if we are talking about uh, Rwanda case as precedent, uh, how soon these propaganda figures can be captured and judged? 
Uh, it is similar and it is not, right? Uh, I think in one way, uh, what we saw in Rwanda was much more explicit and much more direct. And the, in some ways, you know, the tragic and the easy part was that in Rwanda, uh, genocide was established as a crime. And so it was much easier to uh, link the statements to what was happening on the ground. I think in Ukraine, it's a little bit harder. And also the methods of propaganda have become much more elaborate. It, it is not as direct but unfortunately no less efficient and probably more efficient because what Russian propaganda is now doing is playing with images, playing with vocabulary, uh, playing with terminology. And in some ways it is, it is I would say, overall a little bit more subtle or it, it appears to be a little bit more subtle, but in some ways it is even more efficient and thus destructive. So I do think for lawyers like ourselves, for those who are putting together all of these statements and you know imagery that is being pushed out on a variety of Russian channels right now, it is a little bit probably harder task than for those who worked on Rwanda, but ultimately I don't think there is any question as to what they're doing uh, and, and how they're doing this. That said, I do hope that it will not take as long. After all, you know, Rwanda Tribunal was one of the first international tribunals. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have the International Criminal Court back then. But most importantly, and one of the ways in which we are trying to use uh, international justice system in its modern form is through so-called universal jurisdiction, which means that it does not have to be an international tribunal because they all take a long time, no matter you know how efficient mm -hmm. they are or how they're trying to be efficient. But there are all, all of these countries, you know, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Germany, Poland, Lithuania, and many, many others around the world that do have these articles in their criminal codes. And it means that they can open criminal cases. And if, you know, we and other lawyers are able to convince them that the case is strong, it means that they can issue international arrest warrants or arrest warrants that then will turn into Interpol um, red notices. And that is a completely different ball game, right? First of all, it usually takes less time because national justice systems are usually more efficient than international justice system. And second of all, it means that if this system is used efficiently, it does create this uh, net in which it is much easier to catch those figures than, you know, for one court that would in the end only be able to try, you know, one, two, three uh, perpetrators, but definitely not all of them. But I do think it's critically important to open these cases around the world in all of the countries that can technically do that so that no matter where they go, and they will go, right, you know. From Russia, you mean they can go and... I think they so. I think they will. And many of them already have foreign residencies and foreign citizenships and properties abroad you know, and children going to schools elsewhere, right? So I think it is much likelier that these figures compared to, I don't know, Russian submarine commanders that we're also trying to chase, that these figures will go somewhere. And the critical piece is that no matter creative world in which no matter where they go, they will be able to be handed over mm -hmm. to a justice system that would be able to bring them to account. So it's so it may not be the Hague as we usually imagine that in future. It doesn't have to be. I mean, again, I do very much hope, and you know, one of the things we're working on is that the International Criminal Court does add the charge of incitement to genocide to its mm -hmm. collection of charges that is currently pursuing in the Ukraine investigation. I think it's very important symbolically, even if in practical terms it might take longer or may not lead to uh, some tangible results, but symbolically the message is very important. But I do think in practical terms, it is really not just the Hague. We are living in the 21st century where the system of international justice is quite advanced. And there are lots of countries that have both uh, technical means, legal means, and in this situation, quite a lot of political will to pursue it. 
and you know we, we should be using that it's uh, it's really interesting to hear um, and I also want to ask you uh, is there any limit of um, how far this investigation could get into a regime um, which levels of um, of these figures propaganda figures war figures can be captured and judged Well, when it comes to propaganda figures, uh, it's pretty much all the way, right? It's not just the journalists, it's not just the anchors, it's really the owners uh, of the uh, TV channels, potentially uh, shareholders. So anybody who is involved in the promotion of the propaganda, not just the, you know physically articulating it, but enabling it could be held to account. Uh, when it comes to, you know, if, if your question is broader, one thing that this system of universal jurisdiction cannot do is bring to account heads of state usually because they would enjoy diplomatic immunity and it's literally either the international criminal court or a court which will be specifically created you know there's a lot of talk now about creating this hybrid tribunal for ukraine that would specifically address for example the crime of aggression in which again the propaganda figures also might be uh figurants but uh, it is for figures like, you know, the president of Russian Federation, it would have to be an international or internationalized court that would have sufficient authority to overcome diplomatic immunity that he would otherwise enjoy. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I know, you've uh, already traveled uh, to Ukraine and you picked a lot of evidence of war crimes and also make some comparisons with war crimes in Chechnya um, and Syria. Uh, and I want to ask you, uh, uh if uh, the evidence that we already have are enough to pass to a new step, maybe, of the investigation of the pro uh, process uh, of the future tribunal in The Hague, which was already started, as I know. Yes. So, you know, actually, I just came back from Ukraine. Uh, we have been on the ground uh, with my organization since the, you know, almost the first days of the war. Uh, and we're working on different patterns of uh, violations, including uh, unlawful killings and discriminate attacks, executions, torture, sexual violence, and, and many others. We do not work so much with the International Criminal Court. Uh, we're really focused on national courts in other jurisdictions, partially because the International Criminal Court, you know, they do have their own investigation. They do send investigators to Ukraine. Uh, I think it is very important that, you know, there are so many people working on Ukraine, including in the accountability space. So we work in our niche, which I think is the most efficient one. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's actually progressing. Uh, I think in terms of our cases, we obviously, there is no end in sight of what is happening, you know, and I, you know, I was just there mainly in uh, the liberated areas in the Kharkiv region focused mostly mm -hmm. on executions and disappearances and unlawful detention. Uh, just when the attacks happened on Monday, right? And that kind of, and that's pretty much what happens every time we go to Ukraine, we would focus on something and then something. I mean, it is, you know, an investigation that happens in an active war zone where violations continue to happen as we speak. However, with some of the cases that we started uh, a few months ago, I think we have sufficient evidence, both of the crime base, meaning, you know, what happened, but also on linkage, which is very important, which means who did it? In Ukraine so far, it's been relatively easy to establish the perpetrators. And obviously, because we're talking about criminal cases, we have to name the names of the actual perpetrators, of their commanders, and all the way up the chain of command. And I do think by now, we kind of putting, putting this puzzle more or less together and getting ready to file them in different jurisdictions on behalf of Ukrainian survivors who are now there in Germany, in Poland, in Slovakia, in the Netherlands, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this conversation and um, for some maybe new point of view on this future process of, um, of judging. Russia tomorrow. In Russia right now, there are tens of millions of completely normal people who are absolutely terrified by their horrible misunderstanding of this war. Don't give up on us, dear viewer, because we need your help and your GoFundMe cash donation goes right into our broadcast efforts at telling the truth and continuing to look at Russia straight on. 
Help us comfort those who can't find true voices when the government speaks and help us wake up the sleepers. The link to donate is in the description below. From all of us here at Russia Tomorrow, I am Valeria Ratnikova. Thank you for watching. See you soon.